Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our commercial Rainwater Systems Scale Driven Designs webinar. I'm your host, Greg Jackman, the Specification Program Specialist here at Watts. Today's webinar is the next installment in our Watts Works Engineer webinar series geared specifically for you guys, our engineer, architect, and specifier customers. Just to uh, give you a little background on the series, we hold several webinars throughout the year that cover a variety of topics. Our presenters are our in-house technology and product experts, and thanks to our partnership with the American Society of Plumbing Engineers, AFI, uh, we're able to provide you with point one continuing education unit CU credit if you stick around for this entire webinar and most of our other webinars. After today, our next one will be in December, where we'll be introducing our brand new project specification tool to the market that will specify and select Watts products according to building requirements and codes. Uh, we'll get into more details at the time, but if you're interested in registering, please keep your eye out for our emails, or you can reach out to me directly at gregory.jackman at wattswire.com, and I'll sign you up. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to the presenter of today's webinar, Eddie Van Giesen, our Rain Cycle National Sales Manager at Watts, uh, an American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association accredited professional. Eddie is currently active at the state and national level in the development of codes and standards relating to the rainwater industry in association with the International Code Council, International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, and the Canadian Standards Association. Uh, during the duration of today's presentation, the phone lines will be muted, but we encourage you to submit questions via the chat window. Just hover over the chat icon at the bottom of the WebEx and type in your questions there. We'll then be able to address them during and after the presentation. So with that, we pass it off to Eddie get, to uh, get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, and a special thanks to all my teammates at Marcom up here at the corporate office. Uh, as for absolutely for sure, without them, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you today. So thanks and a shout out to them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go for probably 30, 40 minutes, and that all depends on how many questions that we get um, as we move through the presentation. Um, and you can submit questions online, um, and I think we're going to have some online polling that's going to take place at a couple of different uh, places during the presentation. Um, so if you have questions, because I find as a, as a participant that it helps if I pose a question and get an answer, you know, kind of at that same time. So I'll do my best to respond to any questions that you might have or, have, or any clarifications so that you can get the most possible out of the webinar. So a couple of things, little housekeeping things here. Um, this is an ASPCU credits only, and um, I encourage you to read. I'm not going to read all all four of the, uh, the the bullet points here, but they're in the as part of the webinar. So um, having said that, uh, these are the learning objectives <clears throat> that at the end of the course you should be able to discuss the basics, analyze the major pre-filter types, describe the three primary elements of a rain system, <clears throat> employ the appropriate inlet filter types, and identify the two most commonly applied disinfection strategies. So rainwater harvesting, what is it? Well, first of all, <clears throat> and I want to make a, a disclaimer here because in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for any of you people that are um, work in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, gray water is synonymous with rainwater. But anywhere else in the United States, it is not. Gray water refers to a, the waste or the source water. When you wash your hands, what goes down the sink is, in fact, gray water because it's waste water. <clears throat> Rainwater, on the other hand, is primary source water. It's precipitation that has not been used. Very important in this um, description, okay? So what we're talking about, essentially, is a new, is a new paradigm. We're talking about... Uh, not only having water being supplied from what I call the magic pipe, the municipal potable supply line, but also providing a source of water that you can get generated on site. That means condensate water, rainwater, and so forth. So this is basically what we're talking about. And as you can see from the graphic on your right, that we're talking about primarily the water that's used inside the building. And of course, the water can also be used for irrigation. Let's go to the next slide here. So one of the drivers, 
for rainwater harvesting, believe it or not, um, is because of combined sewers. Combined sewers are the culprit or the reason that we have approximately 15,000 overflow events per year. Because as we all know, sewer systems, sanitary sewer systems were designed occupancy-based and very low steady flows. But when you bring weather into the picture and climate into the picture, now you can introduce a much larger source of water and the way that almost all combined sewer systems work is something similar to the graphic where you'll have the water actually overflow over the dam and you'll have raw sewage going directly out into the river. This happens all over the United States. There are many, many cities, top to bottom, east to west, north to south, that have these systems, that have combined sewers. So when you put a rainwater system in there, essentially you're starving the water out of the storm drain and you're putting that in a tank where you can use it in the building therefore reducing some of the instances of combined sewer overflows. There are a number of cities in the United States that promote the practice for that reason only and not even as a result of water conservation, which, which is the obvious reason for rainwater harvesting. So rainwater harvesting, what is it? And you're going to hear me harp on this theme repeatedly. Um, what is a rain system? So is it a collection of parts? It could be. Is it the pumps, the storage tank, and so forth? So these are anecdotes that we got from the field where the guy on the left says, I'll do the rain, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll do the rain system, you do the pumps controls and filtration. And the guy on the right says, no, 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 um, I'll do the, the storage tank um, and pre-filter, you do the rain system. So there's confusion. The point here is that there's confusion over what is a rain system. So we have our first uh, poll, and uh, which of the following components is actually part of a rainwater system? So, so I'm going to um, I'm going to help you out here. So in this slide, you see one, two, and three, and there is your answer. Your answer is they are both, all three: an inlet pre-filter, storage, filtration, disinfection, and distribution. All three of those are absolutely must be part of a rain system. And if they're not, you, you very well could be setting yourself up for failure. Now, the instance of most mechanical engineers, you're dealing with the water within five feet of the building and inside of the building. So if you're not in control of the inlet pre-filter or the storage, you may be in for some surprises because the water in the tank that you're trying to pump and treat may be of a questionable quality because you are not in control or the inlet pre-filter may have been missing or absent altogether. So what is an inlet pre-filter designed to do? All right, I'll open up this poll for you right now. Okay, poll is open. So here are the questions. The, the, to keep the coarse materials out of the tank, to disinfect the water in the primary storage tank, or B, to filter the water downstream of the booster pump. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds here, and we'll close out the poll. So I'm really kind of checking your, sort of checking your acumen as we go, because I haven't really presented entirely on these concepts. So this is sort of a, a pre-test to kind of see where, where you're at. Hopefully, as we move forward through the presentation, this will become a lot clearer. Okay, I'll close up the poll right now. Okay. Then you'll be able to see the poll results come up in a few seconds. This, this will give me an idea to see what background, because if I were doing this live in front of a live audience, I would probably ask the people to raise their hand who have been involved with the rainwater system in the past. So, because we're not doing it to, you know, to directly in person, this gives me a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a peek as to what you may think these terms indicate. Okay, and here are the results. Okay, so I see that uh, we have, most people are getting this, most people are getting this right, it's the A, and you're correct. I guess this is pretty obvious 
The inlet prefills because the rainwater system, you remember, it's got two, essentially two sides. It's got the gravity side, you've got to bring the water down into the tank. And somehow, you're going to have to get the water out of the tank, and generally, most of the time, that's done with a pump with water under pressure. So an inlet prefilter is nomenclature that we typically use in the rainwater industry to indicate some sort of a screen, some sort of a device. Uh, it may be done in conjunction with some first flush diversion, but it's essentially a way to keep the coarse materials, the large chunks of the debris, out of the tank. So in a properly designed rainwater system, the vast majority of the contaminants are going to be organic in nature. Uh, they might be acorns, leaves, or small organic material that may be coming in. And when we do have someone calling us out on our uh, spelling error here, it should say contaminant, not containment. Uh, yeah, good catch. Uh, yes, that is correct. Contamination, you're correct. Somebody's paying attention. Inlet pre-filter. So we're going to spend probably a disproportionate amount of time on the inlet pre-filter during this presentation because I've, my experience over the last 12 years is that this is something that has caused a lot of issues on jobs, especially if it's not thought of in the context of the building, even at the architectural level of the building. So we're going to go through that. So we talked about that. It's the pre-filter. It keeps the coarse contamination out of the tank. Pore size is between 350 and 1,000 micron, and it is a critical component. Leave one out, you're going to have problems because you're going to have a collection and an accumulation of organic material inside the tank. So remember, even with a good pre-filter, you're going to get small debris, debris that's smaller than 350 micron or 1,000, depending on what type of filter you use, that will make its way in the tank. So tanks eventually, eventually, Virtually all tanks will need some sort of cleaning. Different filters do different, um, are, are more effective than others at keeping the debris out. But of course, you remember, it's also the roof area, proximity to the ground, the proximity to other trees, proximity to animals are all going to influence the type of debris that you typically find flowing off a roof surface. Okay. So there are basically two types. The one on the left refers to the vast majority of inlet pre-filters. Some sort of a, a pipe directing the water from the roof to some sort of a filter body with the screen in it. In the event that the screen is blocked or clogged, the water simply overflows and the filtered water goes through the screen to the storage tank. Uh, there is another type of filter, um, not commonly used, more commonly used in uh, when you're taking water off of uh, like a parking surface or a driving surface, but we occasionally do use these in rainwater where the water goes directly into the filter and out, but it's got its own internal overflow. So you can kind of think of this, and you'll see better from the next graphic. You can kind of see that there's a cylinder within a cylinder. So the outside skin of the cylinder, as you can see from the graphic on the right, is porous. Water would go through that in the, in the event that that's all clogged up, is not maintained properly, the water will go flow through because you definitely don't want to be clogging a drain pipe from the roof. So I'm looking at a question here. Any reason, I'm going to read the question out loud for everyone's benefit. Any reason a more efficient filter isn't used as a second stage filtration on the toilet? Um, Um, I'm not really quite sure exactly what you mean by that. You might send me another for that person asking that question. Any reason a more efficient filter isn't used as the second stage of filtration on the tank inlet? Um, I guess the best answer I have for that is that what we're dealing is water by gravity. So there's a lot of things you could do. You can run these through slow sand filters. And they typically take up large space. And we're not to say that you, you can't do it. But the way we typically do it, all of us in the industry, and we've been doing it for quite some time now, is have some sort of gravity device, gravity device that's on that main storm riser. It may be inside the building or it may be outside the building. I hope that answers your, your, your question. But there are, there are lots of ways to uh, tackle this problem technologically. So the next filter is one that's actually installed up in Canada. 
Um, and you'll see the, just this is to give you an idea of the size of the filter. Body on the left is the, you can see the flexible couplings that secure the filter to the pipe. And the picture on the right is the actual screen. It's a, in this particular instance, it's a 400 micron screen. And the black, if you could see it well enough on the, from the photograph, is actually atmospheric deposition. Uh, not roof contamination, but what was actually coming in from the, from the air. Because as we know, water that moves, rain that moves through the atmosphere will pick up particulates, dust, and contamination as it moves through the atmosphere to the roof surface. And this next picture on the right sort of indicates how these uh, particular filters are, are located. And you can see from the graphic on the left that they're located above the tank and each one has its own overflow. The filter on the top is the down, the, the one that actually goes straight down with the internal overflow and the one to the right. You can see three pipes, water in, filtered water to the tank, and then the overflow out, continuing on from left to right. Okay. So here we are, I'm gonna go through these re relatively quickly because they're all variations on a theme. <clears throat> Being that most of these filters were designed in Europe, and many of them in Germany, uh, they were designed to go outside, and you can see where the, the line, the black line is for finished floor or grade line. These are typically installed at grade. They don't have to be below the frost line because they're not designed to hold water, but below grade. And you can put pedestrian tops or um, tops with uh, 820 loading or whatever on top of these things. And you'll also see a pressurized nozzle for self-cleaning. Some of the filters, uh, work better when they're when they have a, a spray that will blow off the contamination between rain events. But once again, uh, we're going to look at a question. So here's another question: uh, Is it? I'm going to read it out loud for everyone. Is there? Is it possible to flush water overflow to discharge wastewater debris to self clean? Um, if I'm understanding that correction, yes. The pressurized line can be from the tank itself. It doesn't have to be from the municipal line, if, if, if I understand the question. If not, you can, you can send me back for some clarification on that. So we're gonna to move to the next one. This is what one of the, the body of one of these particular units look like. You can see the top lid off, and you can see the inside one of the spray nozzles that can be adjusted. So there's essentially a screen, almost flat, where the debris goes over and the thick, coarse material gets stuck in the, in the filter and the clean water goes to the tank. Here's another type. This is the basket filter. It's pretty self-explanatory. Water coming in from the left, always moving from the left to the right in these graphics, moving through the filter basket, filtered water to the tank, and of course, if the basket's full or in extremely heavy rain events, you don't want to impede the water flow, so you have the water go to, over, to, to drain. Now. Key components here are two things. Slow the water down before it gets to the filter body. Very important, because each of these filter bodies will come with its own cut sheet and its own published information about water flows, efficiencies, et cetera. Also pay attention to the invert differential. That's the uh, dimension X, because they're all different, and everything at the bottom of the invert differential X is gonna go to um, feed by gravity out through the overflow pipe. And of course, most of these, you're going to need a minimum of 24 inch clearance on the lid to remove the lid for cleaning. Now, these, as I mentioned earlier, these are designed to go at grade. As you can see, these are direct bury units. That's the basket type there on the right. And you can see some of the typical debris associated with the roof. This was about a 10 story roof. So you see little particles of the asphalt shingle that are some of the smaller debris on the roof. And remember, folks, when you're doing one of these systems, make sure that the, the contractor, it may not be the mechanical, but the general contractor has cleaned the roof first before directing water to the filter or the tank. Because if you don't, you're gonna to have to clean all that debris out of the tank itself. Because um, during construction, it's normal for most contractors to just wash the roof down toward the end of construction, and you do not want to have that in your tank. So the graphic on the left on this particular picture shows one of these filters, which 
as you can see, was designed to, to be installed at grade or below grade, but frequently in large commercial buildings in the United States and Canada will hang these up in the mechanical room, which can be done, but you wanna make sure that you've got enough room for a ladder for someone to remove the lid and so forth for cleaning. And if you make it too difficult, just like anything else, human nature, we tend to ignore things that are more difficult than the easier things. So make it as easy as you can on the installation. Another type, like I say, these are all variations on a the theme. You see these sloped screens. Some are more efficient than others. Some have different pore micron opening sizes. Some flow the water different. Some of, the, some of them, the invert differential is different. You can see that dimension X. But remember, 24 inches grade, slow the water down before it gets into the filter. And as a rule of thumb, you want at least three meters, approximately 10 feet of area to be slowed down at a very minimum slope prior to entering the filter, filter body. But once again, water in, clean water through the filter, and the overflow out the storm drain. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a cross section of one of these types of filters, and they're particularly good. These types are particularly good at catching low flows. Another type is a curved with a curved slope. Um, these are all based on pipe size, and in fact, you're going to ultimately um, look at two things. You're going to look at the published flow rates on the, on the equipment, but more than likely, you're going to be line sizing the pipe. In other words, if you've got an eight inch pipe, you're going to have an at least eight inch pipe feeding one of these filter bodies. We see another question. Yeah, we have a couple more questions here. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask the middle one. Can you place these, these filter, filters in parallel? Absolutely, you can place these filters in parallel because the maximum size for most of the rainwater filters that, that I'm aware of is up to 16 inches or 400 millimeters. So yes, but you need to be, be able to, you know, equally disperse the water going into each of the filters. But yes, you can, you can put them in parallel. Another question, you recommend a bypass filter initial wash down surface? Yes. I recommend a, a bypass wherever code permissible. I was recently in, in, in an engineering presentation and someone, and there are some jurisdictions that do not allow for a bypass with valves and so forth. But yes, it is good to have a bypass. And in fact, in some states, I'm aware of some of the ICC, International Plumbing Code states, uh, bypasses is required by code. We have a couple more questions. A couple more questions. Uh, Flush water over the discharge waste debris to self clean. That's the answer to. Oh, sorry, that's not. Are there any technologies? Are there any technologies that can be implemented for filter maintenance, or is it simply up to the staff to implement a periodic maintenance program? Um, well, I think the closest thing you have to some sort of automation, if I'm understanding the, the, the question, would be these spray nozzles. These spray nozzles do a lot to keep the surface of the screen. A clean and, and you would be surprised um, even when you have a building that's well above any tree line and doesn't appear to be any obvious debris no dirt or anything like that and how does all this debris get on there so spray is really good um, but this must be part let me emphasize this this must be part of the maintenance regular maintenance regime on the building because you want to get the people accustomed to looking at this thing because if they don't guess what just like the you know, the air conditioning vent in your home, you don't clean it, eventually you're gonna get no flow of air, or in this case, no flow of water to the tank. Is there a recommended flow velocity to slow down? Great question. Uh, I, I guess you would look, what you would do is you would look at the efficiency on the flow ratings on the cut sheets for any of these filters. So for example, if one says it's 85% efficient, it's gonna, it's gonna show you similar to a pump, it's gonna show you a curve of where you can get the, your most efficiency. You know, obviously if you, the water's, in this particular instance, if the water is exceeding a certain velocity, a published velocity based on the manufacturer, water will just race right through this thing, regardless of whether the, the screen is clean or not, and at certain flow rates. So it's all published flow rates based on the manufacturer. Uh, okay, so the backflow, um, should a, I'm reading the next one here. Should a backflow valve be after the filter body in the overflow 
to storm. It's always wise to have a backflow device. You want to, in some cases, you may be connected to a combined sewer and you want to prevent the gases and strangely enough, animals and things that may be crawling backwards, especially if you have a small system where the storm drain is open atmosphere, let's say it's going to a detention pond or something like that. Yes, put a backwater valve whenever possible, just a flap, something very simple that's not going to uh, impede because what you don't want to do is create something where you can get debris and catch in it and plug that line up. So we don't want to, you want to make sure you take provisions so that that does not happen. All right, got a lot of questions here. Okay, so um, where would the control valve be installed? Um, we typically are not going to have a control valve. There, this is one of those things that the question is, the question was, if we need to interlock with cistern overflow, where is the control valve to be installed? Um, typically, you would not have a control valve on that. With, with certain exceptions. Broward County, Florida, for example, does not, does not allow overflows on their systems, which is not good for the health of a system, but that's the code and that's the way the co current code is written. Um, but we don't want to create a situation where you can essentially plug the water going back up the storm riser. Um, I probably don't have as much time as I would need to really address that in depth, and whoever wrote that question, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, we could discuss that at, at further. Okay, is it feasible to install this system with a, on a building with a green roof? Great question. Yes and no, or yes and yes, or no and no. And what I mean by that is it depends on the end use. So the first question, and, and folks, if you don't remember anything else I said here on this, uh, on this webinar, you first want to know where's the water coming from and where's the water going to. It's, 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 it's vital because if you don't know where the water's coming from and you're collecting off, say, a parking surface that's got salt in it, you're going to wreak havoc on your plumbing devices, especially if you're going to irrigate with the water. So we want to avoid that. So the types of surfaces that we're looking at that are pre preferable are membrane type, metal, of course, if it's a green roof, glass, or something like that, something relatively inert. Does that mean you can't catch water off a green roof? No, but the water coming off a green roof will be tainted. It will be, uh, has a high degree of dissolved solids, which means it's gonna look like somewhere between the color of tea, black tea and coffee, which is fine if you're gonna drip irrigate it with it. And it's probably okay if you're gonna spray irrigate with it, depending that you've done some appropriate filtration. But it's probably not okay if you're using it for a cooling power or if you're using it indoors for toilet flushing, because it's just human nature. Humans, and we've known, we've noted this for many years. People do not want to see the water discolored before it, the, the toilet or urinal is used. And that, not, not to be funny, but it's, it's really true. People don't want to see that. They want to see clear water. And to get green roof water clear requires a lot of filtration, and it can be done. It can be done, but it can be very costly. Okay. If you are if, if you are in air which may have how did the filter sell down? Okay, so that's a great question. If you're in an area, let's say you're in a dry part of the country where you're gonna have dust, and then you may want to consider some first flush diversion. And first flush diversion is where you can divert a certain amount of water, generally about an eighth of an inch of rain or a few millimeters of rain that come off the structure, and if you have a way to divert that prior to going into the inlet pre-filter, that's really the only effective way of getting out of the very, very fine material. Okay, but you're gonna to have to have a way of automatic means of diverting the water um, after a certain amount of water flushes off. And this is especially true in Western states where you'll have very fine material that's gonna build up over months of no rain before the first rain comes in. So that's a great question. Folks, we got lots of questions. What I'm going to need to, um, I'm going to need to probably speed up a little bit to get through the course because this is these are great questions. But I want to make sure I got the primary equipment covered. So this is another filter. You can see how it's uh, installed, and it can be these can be tough to maintain. In this particular instance, they did not have a clearance to the ceiling, and um, 
as though it's very hard to clean the filter if you can't open the lid. Another type you may be familiar with, the vortex, or it works on a, a vortexing principle where the water comes in, water is slung through the outside, and it's very high quality water that comes off these filters. Um, you do have to pay attention to the invert differential. And once again, slow the velocity down, minimum clearance for lid, lid removal, et cetera. Okay. And this is a picture of one of the, the, the vortex filter installed. And you see the elbow immediately upstream. That is not the optimal design. Uh, you want to have a least, you want to have, like I said, you know, 10 feet, 3 meters, or 10 feet of length ahead of time. This is why it's vital to understand how these filters work when you're laying out your plumage, uh, your plumbing drainage. So to select it, kind of as a conclusion, it goes indoors, out, access for maintenance, floor drain to handle spills, put a curb in there. Cheap, easy curb in a floor drain. You're going to get some spills. Slow down the velocity, run the pressure line, and we talked about the bypass. May or may not be required. Okay. So these are four different applications. Going to run through these really quickly. Uh, they're direct buried, where you can put the body of the filter below grade in some sort of configuration like this. That's one way. Where you've got your access lid, and remember, you don't have to be below the frost line for all of you folks in the northern latitudes. Another type is a essentially very low tech kind of screen, and these are effective sometimes where you um, it, it, the, the filtration is not that critical. These are typically larger pore micron sizes, but as you can see from the photo on the right, don't do that. Don't put these at grade. You want to have these up above grade. Sometimes, folks, it's the best to teach for what not to do. You want to have these four or five feet above grade so that snow or debris or someone doesn't kick it or animals get involved with it or something like that. This is another application, and this shows the bypass around it with the three with the three valves. It was pointed out to me recently that in some jurisdictions this may not be allowed. Because if you've got all those valves off and you get a big rain event, guess what? You're gonna the water's not gonna pass through the filter. But this allows you to clean it, and of course you can put these also put these filters in parallel as well. Another type is where the filter bodies are not suitable for direct bury, but they can go in a concrete vault or some sort of a fiberglass or um, uh, vault to handle the lateral and the um, top pressures on the filter. Okay, And this is another one, an application is more typically found in Europe, where you would put the filter body in the access lid directly above the tank itself. So all of this needs to be thought out, must be thought out when you're considering considering putting a rain system in. And the fo photo on the left shows what happens when you get too much velocity coming in these things and they ripped this particular screen off like a sardine can, just from the force of the water. And of course on the right, that's a picture of what happens when you have a floating extractor and you have no inlet prefiltration. Even with a floating extractor, you're gonna have a clogged up tank. Storage, not gonna spend a lot of time on storage folks because um, that's a big topic and that's almost a webinar unto itself, but suffice to say, from rain barrels to large underground tanks to large modular concrete tanks, poured in place concrete tanks um, that are generally designed along with the building itself. Oops, let's go back here. True or false, uh, all rainwater must be dyed blue for identification purposes. So this is our, our poll. All right, I'm opening up the poll now. So while everybody's um, thinking about that, so I'm getting a lot more, a lot more participation in this one. All right, we'll close down the poll now. One, 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 two, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, close down the poll. So, folks, the answer is no. Um, unless you're in Massachusetts. If you're in Massachusetts, you do have to dye the water because remember we talked about Massachusetts being a uh, state that does not recognize rainwater per se as a source water, but recognize rainwater, identifies rainwater as storm water. Okay? So anytime you can dye 
um, the water, of course, but it's an extra level of complexity. And some people will dye to color the water, but you know what, if you take brown water and you put blue to it, you're gonna get some muddy color and it's probably not advisable to do that, okay? If you're getting brown water, you got a problem. You need to address the root of the problem. Something's wrong with your tank, your filters need cleaning, or you got some extra contamination on the roof that you were unaware of, okay? Storage fundamentals, vent properly, the venting is not so much to, for, for outgassing like you would have in a septic tank, but really water in, air out. Keep the animals out. Consider equipment retrieval. How are you going to re remove that pump? If you have a submersible pump, floats, probes, etc., you want to have those as close to the manway covers as possible. Eliminate not light, because if you put light, nutrient, water, and of course sun, light, and it doesn't have to be sun, you can create algae growth and it's, it can, it's really, really bad. Um, and of course, it can heat up the tanks if you have above ground tanks. In authorized human access, in other words, lockable um, lids and so forth. And then, of course, you want to determine the proper rainwater cistern sizing. And, and once again, that's a whole subject unto itself. Storage goals, storage management. I'm going to go through this really quickly, folks. If you're managing for water supply, you want the tank full at all times. If you're managing for stormwater control, guess what? Full tank's not going to do you any good. Conflicting goals, how do you get around that? <clears throat> you really need to understand your goals for sizing your system, why you sized it a certain way, and how the building is going to be used. Those things will all inform you about how to size your system. Some of the stormwater management is going to be determined by your local municipality to begin with. But you'll need to understand that in addition to the amount of water that you may want to be using in the building based on occupancy, okay? <clears throat> this is a, a picture of some of these installed in nice hockey uh, rink in Canada. And you can see two different tanks set aside in the, ring, in the arena itself. And this particular system was used to make ice. And it was not for water conservation that this system is in here. This system is in here because it contributes to the reduction in combined sewer overflow. <clears throat> okay, so we got this. <clears throat> Filtration, disinfection, and distribution. We're going to go really quickly over this thing because I think there's one of my questions that we may ask later on is um, what are the two most common types of disinfection strategies? There's a lot of ways you can disinfect the water copper, silver nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and, and there are others. But the two most common methods are, so this, this is my question, true or false, UV disinfection units only function properly when filtration through five microns or smaller occupies, occurs upstream of the UV unit. True or false? Give you a moment to respond, we're getting a lot of response. So, we get, so we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of responses coming in and they're, they're all over the board. So remember, the primary contamination, while well, this is, we're compiling the results here, the contamination in a rainwater system generally speaking, is organic in nature, and you, what, we're, what we want to do is get that particulate filtration out of the water stream upstream of the UV unit, because the UV units are not effective when the water has high levels of turbidity or there are high levels of suspended particles. So a rule of thumb, most manufacturers for UV units require filtration to five microns upstream of the UV unit. Okay, here are the results here. Okay, so let's just slide down here. So I see most, most people, uh, there was a, a higher group that said true than false. The true is correct. These are not, um, uh, they really work properly when they have the five microns upstream. So that is correct. True. Now, 
Filtration levels. You're dripping, drip irrigation versus spray, two totally different animals. Um, in many jurisdictions, spray irrigation is in a public setting where you're going to expose people unwittingly to rainwater harvesting, you may want to consider filtration, uh, disinfection. Drip systems, not so much. And the, the, the idea, folks, is that it's the level of interaction, human interaction that you have with the water. So if you're walking by a ball field or a hospital or any kind of commercial building or public building where there's spray irrigating the, you know, the plants on the sidewalk or the grass, you may be breathing that water. And if that water is contaminated or has things in it that are bad for you, you don't want to be breathing it. So more than likely, you're going to want some form of disinfection system in that spray drip, not so much. You can simple, simple filtration, 50 or 100 microns is usually, usually fine. Toilets, urinals, cooling towers, typical, not necessarily always, but typical uh, disinfection is UV, where you'll have a 50 micron filter followed by five or smaller than the UV. And of course, chlorine disinfection, you want a minimum of 50 micron followed by one micron filter filtration and then chlorine injection. So those are just two ways, not the only way, but the two of the most common ways that what we see works in rainwater harvesting. So just to give you an idea, the graphic on the left represents a filter, a stainless steel screen type filter, and the filter on the right represents a, a, a bag filter. Now remember, key component here, if, the, if your owner of this system is not maintaining their filter and you continue to run water through this, pressure differentials across the filter of above four or five PSI will have the tendency to pulverize and extrude that organic material through either the membrane or the bag or the, or the screen. So you may not actually be removing it, uh, you may just be making the, the contamination smaller and smaller as it moves through the filtration sequence. And you can see on the bottom, the 50, the 5, the disinfection and the end use. Or in the case of the chlorine, maybe you want to go smaller than that. Disinfection, sterilization, we're not trying to sterilize the water, we're just trying to make the water uh, not injurious to your health, you or other people that may be exposed to the water. This is, I'm not going to read all this, but this is the, the different wavelength. But the key component here is the graphic on the right represents particles that can create shadows in the water, micro shadows that keep the, the UV from uh, impacting the microorganism. Now remember, UV does not kill per se the organisms. It renders the DNA incapable of replicating. Okay, so remember, it's not killing it but making the bacteria or the viruses incapable of replicating. Um, disinfection, this is showing a typical uh, disinfection system with a chlorine tank and an injection pump, and on the left, the a chlorine dye pump. Not gonna read all this, but suffice to say that um, there are things that chlorine does better at killing um, than UV and vice versa. And in many instances, with uh, drinking water systems at least, you may have both of these in combination. But typical non-potable uses for rainwater, just one of the two disinfection strategies, typically not both. Pumps, I'm gonna go very quickly over the pumps. Um, pump, the, choose the proper pump based on your application. Of course, your flow and pressure. Take into account your pressure drops through your different membranes and filtration and disinfection options. Submersible pumps, which we see a lot of in rainwater harvesting, are typically laid sideways in the tanks. There are lots of ways to do it. And of course, picking the proper pump has a lot to do with the performance in your building. We're gonna talk here in a minute, a couple of applications, and really gonna focus on the, the last piece of this webinar on these applications. And I really wanna drive home the point, very important here. So you're going to see in the next two or three slides essentially two ways of treating and pumping rainwater out of a tank. One is what we call a direct flow, and it is an on-demand system, not terribly dissimilar from something that you would have at your home 
for any of you who live out in the country, on a well. You'll have a pump, a pump sized for your maximum flow that's capable of pushing the water, you know, with a certain amount of flow and pressure to your end use through the different levels of filtration through the UV unit. And we find that at low flow rates, this works very well. As you start to get higher flow rates above 50 gallons per minute, in some cases above 30 gallons a minute, you're essentially creating a system that is an on-demand when, as we all know, if you're using Hunter's Curve to, um, you know, for your, to, to, to advise you as to what your flow and pressure requirements are going to be, those are very rarely ever hit. In other words, if you have a commercial building with 100 toilets, uh, you might actually size your pump for 100 gallons a minute, but the likelihood that your pump will ever hit 100 gallons a minute is very low. You might be running that pump at, you know, 15, 20, or 30 gallons a minute. But now you've sized all of your equipment for those maximum flows, in which case you may want to consider this second design. So the second design essentially involves two of the point. We get, I'm getting a question about the, what is the point of the aerator. I'll get that question in just a second. So in the second scenario, you see the submersible pump, which is now acting as a transfer pump. So I can transfer the water through the filtration into the tank. In this particular instance, I'm moving past the, the chlorine tank. In other words, it's the first pass into the tank. And I can move that water at a slower rate than the booster pump. So let's say it's 100 gallons a minute, but we know the likelihood of hitting that is very small. So we can move the water in the tank at a much slower rate, maybe 20, maybe 30 GPMs. And then we can size the buffer tank to give a volume of water that in some eventuality we may hit that 100 gallons a minute. For how long would we hit it? And by doing that, we're able to size the buffer tank much bigger, but we can keep the filtration and the UV and the other pumping requirements at a lower flow rate. Okay, very important. So I'm going to show the next slide with a UV disinfection, same thing. So boosting the water out, say at 100, you can transfer the water in at a much lower flow rate. And of course, that's going to be a combination of the pump and the buffer tank capacity. Uh, some people refer to these buffer tanks as day tanks, in which case you might think of that as a day's worth of water. Um, trickle feed or slow feed the water through the filtration system have a body of water now ready for the booster pump to pump out to the end use. And of course, we have our, um, our, our bypass water supply. In some jurisdictions, we can put this downstream of an RPZ, and we can plumb it directly in. In some jurisdictions, we have to feed the buffer tank with the municipal water, thus allowing the air gap. And in some jurisdictions, they require both. They require the RPZ in addition to the air gap to the tank. All depends on the jurisdiction and what's permissible. This is the cross section of a tank, and I'm going to get to the aerator. What is the purpose of an aerator? The aerator in these tanks, we're not exactly sure um, of the science behind this, uh, but we started putting these on our tanks probably seven or eight years ago, and a lot of us in the industry, and the it will have effect of absolutely killing any odors that you might get in these tanks. Um, you will get an anaerobic zone that's going to develop at the bottom of the tanks. The degree to which is all determined by how much uh, organic debris, debris you have in the tank. The more organic debris in the tank, the more it's trying to decompose, the more anaerobic gases are pre created. So the aerator, at the very, very minimum, can allow the air to go out through the air vent. And we also do know that there are beneficial uh, biofilms in these tanks. There's plenty of science to suggest that, that they operate as discrete ecosystems in these tanks. These are not the same biofilms we're talking about in the water distribution lines. That's why we typically do not disinfect the main storage tanks. So does the aerator play some, play some role in that? It may be. Not really quite sure, but um, it's very cheap insurance. And of course, you want them to run when the pumps are not running. Okay. So as we, as we begin to wrap this up, um, the photo on the left shows what happens when 
the state of California and specifically the city of San Francisco um, essentially requires a certain amount of rainwater harvesting. So the different buildings muse from a museum, the MoMA Museum of Modern Art, there's two, um, as one office tower, and then two, um, uh, two different residential towers, all using rainwater uh, to flush toilets in the building. And uh, many of other buildings that I couldn't put arrows to also have, system, also have rainwater systems. The building on the right, the picture on the right is the, are the two tanks um, in Canada, in Montreal, and it's for making water. And remember, this wasn't a conservation move. This was a stormwater management move because they were getting so much flooding of sewage water in the uh, dressing rooms in the area. Now, they did put backwater valves in there, but a backwater valve is only good if that pipe, if that sewer distribution pipe, the sewage drainage pipe, is not completely full. If it's full and you want to use the bathroom at the same time, even with the backwater valve, the water's not going out. So that's one of the reasons that the city of Montreal has been doing so much rainwater harvesting. Okay, so folks, we are just about right on time here. So I'm gonna cover, there's a, there's a couple more things that I'm gonna cover and if, if I haven't already. So remember the three primary elements of a rainwater system, inlet filtration, storage, pumping, and treating. Those are the three primary elements. The two most common disinfection methods we reviewed that, it's chlorine and UV. Not to say that they are the only type of the two most commonly used disinfection methods. Um, another question would be, which um, end uses require the least amount of filtration? Above ground spray, cooling tower makeup, toilet urinal flushing, or sub subsurface or drip irrigation? The correct answer would be the subsurface or drip irrigation because we just want to keep the particles out of the drip emitters, but because there's such low potential for human contact, a lot of disinfection not required. The earth and the, the soil can handle that. And the last one is um, we talked about green roofs. Green roofs are fine to collect water if you're doing drip irrigation or, or even spray in some instances, but not recommended, not recommended when you're sending that water back inside the building because to clean the water up sufficiently can require lots of filtration. If your customer or your client doesn't care, they don't, they don't mind the water being uh, you know, murky and, and very dark colored, it, it, it's fine. But there are also contamin contaminants. Some green roofs get fertilized. Fertilizer equals salt. Salt is bad in plumbing systems. Okay, can it be cleaned out? Yes, it can. But you can also get biofouling to occur on the uh, reverse osmosis membranes. You can't just put a reverse osmosis system on one of these unless you properly filter them upstream of that. Otherwise, you'll get these membranes clogged very, very quickly. So we talked about the major pre-filter types, the three elements, oops, um, and where and when to use the different pre-filter types based on your building. Um, and we, as you should be able to discuss some of the basics of a rainwater harvesting system as a renewable resource. And of course, the reasons that we do it, water conservation, obviously, and stormwater control. So with that, we are right at the hour mark. So if there are any other questions. Yes, uh, if you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat window here and we'll address them. We did have a few uh, come in in the last 10 or 15 minutes here, Eddie. Uh, first one on our list, would you ever use chlorine and UV? And I think that was back on the below ground tank slide. Which one, which one was that, Chlorine? Uh, the below ground tank slide. The question was, uh, would you ever use chlorine and UV? Together? Uh, yeah, well, sometimes there are, we, we, don't, we don't do them it, it, in, in our company, but there are a lot of people that do uh, drinking water systems where they may very well have chlorine and UV together. For non-potable applications, really my experience doing this, that's, that's overkill, not necessary. Um, you know, there may be, I'm not saying that th th there may be some jurisdictions, but managing chlorine in a micro system is, is, is a little difficult, so similar to managing the water quality in a small aquarium, 
versus a large aquarium. You, things can go bad really quickly by overdosing or underdosing uh, in chlorine systems. And frankly, we see more problems with overdosing in chlorine systems. You can eat up your pipes, copper pipes, and so forth pretty quickly. Um, okay, yeah, the next one here. Uh, are there systems using a building sump pump systems as a source of collected rainwater? Uh, yes, depending on, but the key is not whether it's a sump pump, the key is where is the surface? Are we collecting from a parking, driving, ground surface where we may be using a sump pump? That's really the question. So, you know, an elevator shaft, you know, which they you know, no, we don't want to do that. So we want to be, it's really the, 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 the bigger question is what is the surface, okay? So can you collect from a sump? Yes, but you want to know what the sump is collecting the water from. I think this is a follow-up from the prior question. Is there a standard regu regulate, is there any standard regulate this process? If I understand the quest question, is there a standard? There, is a, there are a number of standards. One is the ASB 63 standard that regulates uh, rainwater, I mean, not regulates, it's a, it's a standard that's available. As you know, standards are not enforceable by law unless they're referenced in code. There's another standard uh, developed by the International Code Council, which is called the ICC um, CSA, for the Canadian Standards Association. B is in BOI 805. That's another standard that focuses more on water quality and so forth. But these are two standards that can be that you can that you can reference in North America. Okay, next question. Is it recommended to use UV before the chlorine injection? Well, I think what you're getting at is that there is, UV can destroy, reduce the effectiveness of chlorine. So you're probably going to do it. You, you probably want to do it upstream. To be honest with you, I have seen it both ways, and I don't really know, uh, uh, I don't really know the efficacy of that. I don't want to tell you something I'm not absolutely certain on um, that, but typically we don't see that. We don't see both of them in combination for non-drinking water systems. Okay, next question. What is the point of the recirculation pump? The recirculation pump, two reasons. Number one, when you have chlorine systems and you want to maintain a residual between a certain amount, in other words, between 0.5 and 2.5 milligrams per liter or parts per million, and that's typically a range that is required for most non-potable systems. The only way to accurately measure the chlorine is to put the water running through um, some sort of circulation. And you're able to, if you, if you have the proper uh, analyzers, chlorine analyzers, you can actually uh, manipulate the dosage to stay within those rates, okay? So that's why we typically see that for UV systems, in some instances, we want to cool off the UV lights, or in the instances of in some schools and places that may have intermittent flow, we may have water sitting in those tanks for weeks or months at a time if it's turned off. So if you simply recirculate it, you're able to keep the water um, from getting the biologicals to build up. Hope that answers that one. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. Next one here, what can we do with acidic stormwater? Okay. So, uh, and if, if, you, if you're referring to stormwater as rainwater, um, j just so you'll know, rainwater is, we, we never see it. I don't, I mean, I don't, to my experience, have ever seen pH in a storage tank at seven. It's always going to be less than seven. Six is, in some cases, five. Um, so what do you do? You want to neutralize it. If it's important to the health of your pipes in your building, you're going to want to run it through some sort of pH neutralization. Not terribly hard. There's calcite filters. There's a number of ways that that, that can be done. Uh, they can be done in the buffer tank to get the water closer to seven. So that's that's a good point. You don't want to have very low pH water going into your building because it can wreak havoc over time with the plumbing in the building. Great. Uh, another question here: Fine silt rainwater. Is there settling time or minimum retention time? Not quite sure about that question. Um, the, the tanks that receive the water from the roof are going to sit in there, in, in some cases, for you know months at, at a time. And the idea is to 
bring water in and use it. We're not just trying to, you know, store water. That's one of the reasons that we put the aerators in there. We'd like the aerators in there to keep the keep the keep the water from going, you know, anaerobic and going septic over time. Um, the fine silt, the best way to get the fine silt out of the tank is to divert it before it ever gets to the tank with some sort of inlet, I mean, some sort of first flush diversion. Um, but the tanks will eventually need to get cleaned. And of course, that all depends on the type of inlet pre-filter you put in. The more sophisticated filter, the finer the screen, the mesh, the less frequently you'll have to clean out the tank as a general rule of thumb. I don't like to say you'll never have to clean the tank because it's prob probable that almost any tank Never say never, but generally speaking, almost any tank will need cleaning at some point. Okay. Uh, another question here, should the bypass be sized as per the local code as if there were no storage system? Y yes. You, you, want to, you, don't, if, you don't ever want to impede the stormwater, ever. This, this system has to flow through whether your tank is full, whether you're diverting the water, whether you're diverting water around the, the, the um, the, the tank itself, you don't want to divert the water around the inlet pre-filter if that water is going to the tank, because then you're going to have dirty water go to the tank. But yes, you can divert the water all the, around the, all the way around the entire system. In fact, we advise most of the people that we're involved with to do that until the system, until the building's finished, because all that debris on the roof tends to wash down into the tank. So that's one of the reasons for that. Okay. Those are all the questions we have. So thank you, Eddie, and everyone who joined us today. Uh, just to let you guys know, a recording of this presentation and your CEU credit will be emailed to you. If you have any other sort of logistical type questions, you can direct them towards me at gregory.jackman at wattswater.com. And for more of the technical and topic related questions, please reach out to Eddie at edward.vangiesen at wattswater.com. Yes, and if I missed, um, and I, I, I think I may have missed a couple of questions. So if anybody, you got some burning questions, just send it to me uh, directly, and I'll do my best to to answer that. Or, yeah. And just one more thing. Uh, also, once this WebEx ends, it'll bring you to a page where you can visit our Watts Rain Cycle page, and you can watch our on-demand webinars from this series and complete the quizzes to earn uh, more SBCU credit as well. So again, thank you all for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone's time.